So now we look at a geometric channel and we said we are going to look at modeling the behavior of a wireless channel from a geometric methodology and for that we will actually do this one ray at a time. Okay. So again, rays have to be launched from the base station and they have to be received by the UE. I mean it could be the other way around but you know for the sake of argument we look at a double link channel. We have the transmitter and we have the receiver as shown here. And then the transmitter is going to launch one ray, one electromagnetic ray in whichever direction that it chooses to. And this ray, for the sake of our modeling, gets reflected by this nebulous cloud that I have here called reflectors. Sometimes they're referred to as scatterers, but they all do the same purpose. They reflect the electromagnetic ray that, that, that impinges on it and deflect it in any which direction. Okay, and for the sake of argument, there could have been multiple such reflectors that affect a given ray, but for the sake of argument, I'm going to say this one ray gets launched from this base station in this direction, and I'm going to give it an angle theta, and it's going to get reflected by this nebulous cloud that I have here and arrive on the receiver at some other angle phi in relation to some, you know, some datum that I have taken. Right? This is very simple, right? We have a ray that gets launched at some angle, gets reflected somewhere in this nebulous wireless cloud. Don't get this confused with the Amazonian cloud. This is just the, the wireless channel. And then it arrives on the on the, the UE at some other angle. Okay. Now I'm gonna say that each of these things is going to affect the ray's gain as it travels through this wireless channel. Now, the gain here on the transmitter side is, let's say you have a transmitter, right, which is the antenna. This antenna is launching a ray in that direction. Okay, so then the antenna's gain of the transmitter in this particular direction uh, or at, at an angle theta at which the ray is launched is going to affect the gain of this ray. And I'm going to call that Tx antenna gain. Okay, so it's the transmitter antenna gain at this angle theta that's going to affect how this ray, how, uh, you know, what the gain of this ray is. And then that same ray now gets reflected in this wireless channel and that gain is going to be, and I'm, I'm saying it this way as a matrix, so bear with me while I explain what this matrix is. So this ray got launched by a transmitter antenna. That antenna could be polarized either horizontally or vertically, right? And that ray is going to be received by a receiver antenna, and I'm going to draw that as well here. So that's the receiver antenna. And that receiver antenna could be polarized horizontally or vertical. So this matrix here is essentially the gain going from a vertical to vertical, vertical to horizontal, horizontal to vertical, and horizontal to horizontal antennas. So for all intents and purposes, I'm going to say that this is a diagonal matrix only because a vertically polarized signal into a horizontally polarized antenna may probably have very low gain, and I'm saying that very low gain is a zero. But this works for the sake of modeling. Now that ray, what did we do? We traced the path of the ray from the transmitter antenna and gave it a gain here, and then we traced it through these reflectors and gave it a gain there, and now it arrives on the receiver, and obviously there is a receiver antenna gain at this angle phi that it arrives at. That's pretty much how the life of this one ray is, as it travels from the transmitter side to the receiver side. Now, a single ray makes no wireless communication. Obviously, the, the transmitter is launching bundles and bundles of rays. So what I do is that I take 20 rays and sum up the gains of these individual rays as they go through this wireless medium. And then I say that this is one cluster or one tag of my wireless channel model. Recall the last time in the, in the classical modeling I said the channel has power profile and delay profile associated with these tabs. In the geometry modeling case, we refer to these tabs as clusters 
each of the cluster is modeled to have 20 rays. Each of the ray has a gain that is a function of the transmitter antenna, the wireless channel, and the receiver antenna. All right. If I did this, then I have modeled every tab or every cluster of my wireless channel in a geometric sense. So that's where we would, you know, that's how the, the wireless channel modeling differs from a classical case in, in for the geometric case because here we have to take into account each and every ray and the angles of each of these rays and how the, the transmitter antenna gains and the receiver antenna gains change as a function of these angles. The, the channel's gains is not really you know, related to the angles, more so than the horizontal and vertical polarization of the, the transmitter the electromagnetic ray as it was launched from the transmitter. Now, in some simple case, this is how a wireless channel will be modeled geometrically, but it doesn't stop here. We bring in a little more uh, uh, complications or a little more you know, uh, details into this. So we said that we have to understand how these the, the, the gains will change as a function of the angle, right? So we said a single ray has an angle theta and an angle phi, and therefore a transmitter gain as a function of the angle theta, and a receiver gain as a function of the angle phi. Now, we also said that a cluster has 20 such rays, okay? So, we said we have 20 rays that form a cluster that gets launched from the transmitter, and then they get received at the receiver. And then we also said that the gain of each of these rays is a function of the angle theta and the angle phi. Now, obviously, we don't want to launch all the 20 rays from the transmitter, at the same angle because then it would have the same gain and it would just look like a single ray. But the rays as they get launched from the transmitter, they get launched in different, well they get launched at slightly different angles such that they now form a bundle that has a particular angular distribution. Okay, And the way that looks is it's got a Laplacian distribution. So we pick rays the median value there, and then the other 20 rays have angles that are distributed around this mean angle in a Laplacian manner. So we have now 20 rays. We take these 20 rays, and then we compute the transmitter antenna gains, and then we compute also the receiver antenna gains. Just like how we had a Laplacian distribution on the transmit side, we also have a Laplacian distribution of the arrival angles. And so now we have 20 rays each ray having a different transmit antenna gain, theta i, e to the j theta i, and a different receiver antenna gain, e to the j phi i, well, not just e, but I would have to obviously say there is an alpha px and alpha rx component. So there is, there is a gain and a phase associated with the transmitter, and there's a gain and a phase associated with the receiver. For each one of these rays. And if I take 20 of these rays and sum them up, miraculously, that becomes a complex number whose real and imaginary parts have Gaussian distribution. And we've been there before. So if the real and the imaginary part are Gaussian, then that complex number has a radius distribution. And therefore, this particular thing, this particular summation of the, uh, the gains of 20 rays launched with a Laplacian distribution from the transmitter, received with a Laplacian distribution at the receiver, with a mean angle theta and phi, now looks like a really coefficient, which is the same as how we model the wireless channel in the classical sense. But we've done this in a geometric sense, where we strictly under we strictly inspected each ray and gave it a particular angle of transmission also referred to as an angle of departure, and a particular angle of deception, also referred to as an angle of arrival. So, we have an angle of arrival and an angle of departure distribution associated with this cluster. Now, if I did this for many different clusters, then I would get a wireless channel with multiple taps. But that would be modeled using the geometric sense and, you know, I mean, just like what we did in the other case, we obviously will have to multiply it by the Doppler in order to give it the correct Doppler. 
And the other thing that I'm missing here is obviously the, the polarization. So I'm just going to put a phi around there. That's the polarization gain from vertical to vertical, vertical to horizontal, and so on, right? And that's a simple fixed number. So vertical to vertical, we can say, has high gain equal to 1. Vertical to horizontal has 0 gain. So it's like an identity matrix, one could say, right? And this is how I would have modeled, in a geometric sense, a single cluster or a single tab of a wireless channel by taking 20 rays, associating with them a transmitter angle theta, angle of departure, an angle of arrival angle phi, and then associating a Laplacian distribution around the angles of departures and arrivals, thereby creating 20 rays, computing the gain of each one of these 20 rays as it travels from the transmitter through the wireless channel and arrives at the receiver, and adding these 20 things up to give me a single complex number, which now has the real and imaginary parts to be Gaussian distributed, thereby their complex number becomes a Rayleigh distribution number, and that can then be used to represent one single tab or one single cluster of my wireless channel. So this is how we model the wireless channel in a geometric sense. In the classical sense, as I said, it's very easy. I need to create a, a, a fading coefficient, which is Rayleigh distributed, which has a real and imaginary part to be individually, independently Gaussian distributed. And we all know that Gaussian distribution, so if I take enough number of random variables and I add them all up, then the new random number that I generate as a sum of all of these other random numbers has a Gaussian distribution, also referred to as a central limit theorem. So from central limit theorem, I know that if I add in enough number of random variables with whatever distribution that they may have, then Z turns out to have a Gaussian distribution, normal distribution, with a mean, which is of course a function of the means of these, and a variance, which is a function of the variance of these. But one can always scale those to get it to be zero mean and uh, whatever variance that they want. So the way a wireless channel, a classical wireless channel, will be modeled is somebody will generate enough number of random variables, add them all up, and generate a Gaussian variable for the real part, an imaginary part, and do this for any number of tasks that they want. And then to each of that, they impose the Doppler, and then they're done. In the geometry case, as we said, we go through the process of creating angles of arrivals and departures and Laplacian distributions around them, computing the gains and adding them up. So if you look at it, each of the gains associated with a single ray, so we have 20 rays that we are adding here, can be thought of as a random number. And I'm adding enough number of these random numbers, and that becomes Gaussian. So at the end of the day, a wireless channel can be modeled by adding up enough number of random variables, but then giving it a particular structure such that it has the correct power profile, delay profile, and a Doppler. And we could do this either in the classical sense or in the geometric sense. But at the end of the day, that's pretty much what we did. And that's how we model wireless channels.